Um, I'm very pleased to announce Andy or Andrew Nichols. Um, he had this really impressive paper um, about a year ago on his H star model, and um, we started communicating with him a little bit and like tried to like invite him as an um, own, set up and um, highlight on his research. And then he emailed back and said like, hey, we've got this really large NERC project funded. And we seized that opportunity to invite him here and like sort of showcase his work as it's been going on uh, at Exeter and like with lots of collaborators. Um, and it will be continuing and we hope to like hear from him in our community um, with CSDMS. So Andy, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, and um, thanks, James, for the invitation, and, and thanks also for helping out with that grant application and providing the letter of support, which ultimately helped us out there being successful. So, um, yeah, I want to start, I guess, first by acknowledging the very large number of people you can see here who have been involved in some of the work that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to be thinking about, uh, you can see the evolution of, um, of large river floodplains, talking about some recent, uh, recent progress in that area, uh, some problems and some issues of uncertainty to you know, try and fit in with the, uh, with the theme of the meeting. Um, I want to think about a couple of different spatial and temporal scales. Okay, so firstly, just thinking about the smallest of these spatial scales, I want to think about what's going on within individual channel belts. Okay, so we've got a large meandering river here. If we want to think about the evolu evolution of that, we need to think about sediment transport in the river, channel migration, overbank processes, uh, bar and island construction, and the sort of evolution of the system over at least, I guess, several hundred years. Okay, that's one scale. I also want to think about a larger spatial and temporal scale, okay? So we can, we can then go outside the channel belt. So we're, we're looking at the Rio Beni there in Bolivia, and we've got the active channel belt at the top of the image, and then we've got the larger floodplain. And once we, once we start thinking about that sort of spatial scale, we need to think about how sedimentation within the channel belt can lift the channel belt up above the floodplain, create an alluvial ridge, and therefore ultimately possibly drive avulsions and a relocation of the channel belt onto the floodplain. Okay, and, and lead to those sorts of processes of compensational stacking that we, we heard about yesterday. Okay, so those are the two scales that I want to think about. I, I, just, I wanted to point out before I go any further, though, of course, that um, you know, I'm referring there to meandering systems. Of course, there are a whole range of different channel patterns that we might find within the channel belt, not just meandering. So we've got braided systems here, like the, uh, the Brahmaputra Jamuna. And then also some really, depending on your perspective, beautiful and actually horrible, if you're a modeler, um, situations. You know, where we've got this sort of multi-threaded meandering system, we're not even really sure where the channel, what's channel belt and what's floodplain, but we know there are some complex interactions to try and deal with there. Okay, final bit of context. Obviously, there's a very wide range of sort of river and floodplain models that have been developed in the past, and I just want to try and draw a distinction um, between them. So, uh, on the left-hand side there, we've got a couple of models that are used for looking at very long-term uh, river evolution, channel migration, floodplain sedimentation, and, uh, and channel belt avulsion. And in these sorts of really long-term models in the past, they haven't explicitly included any representation of hydrodynamics on the floodplain. Because, the, because they need to run for such a long time, it's just computationally not possible. And so consequently, they need to parameterize some of the, the processes that are driven by hydrodynamics, such as overbank sedimentation. And that's where the, the sort of classic exponential decay law comes from, which is commonly used in those sorts of models for modeling the, the decrease in sedimentation as, as you move away from the channel or the channel belt. And then on the right-hand side, we've got some models um, that are typically applied over much shorter time and space or smaller time and space scales um, that do have a hydrodynamic driver and think about processes such as overbank sedimentation or channel morphodynamics. You know, and if we start to put those sorts of ingredients together, then we can think about uh, the sort of feedbacks between channel and floodplain processes within the channel belt that I referred to earlier. Okay, so those are the, the two contrasting approaches to modeling. And I want to think uh, to start with about that sort of what I call a higher resolution approach, although actually having seen the, uh, the St. Anthony Falls um, uh, modeling yesterday, the, my ideas about high resolution have been slightly revised. There certainly are, are millions of grid cells in any of these models. But anyway, um, so you know, there, there are a whole range of models, and I've listed just a few of them now on the right-hand side, but there are many of them that take similar approaches to these sorts of problems. So they're implemented on structured or unstructured meshes, maybe grids or curvilinear uh, meshes, and they solve partial differential equations for fluid flow and sediment transport, 
uh, to model patterns of erosion and deposition and therefore channel and floodplain evolution through time. So I'm going to talk about some results from a specific model, but I think what I'm trying to, you know, the main points I'm trying to make are generic and they run across models. I'm not talking about this one particular model really. But I'm going to show you some results from a particular model. Um, no equations in this, I'm afraid. So there are a couple of references at the bottom if you want to see um, the basis for this. Um, so the model I'm going to talk about it involves a sort of coupling of, of a hydrodynamic component and a sediment transport component. The hydrodynamic component is based on the, the 2D depth average shallow water equations with a correction for secondary circulation. The sediment transport component just involves two grain sizes. So there's a, there's a sand component and sort of total sand transport rates, so that's suspension plus bed load are modelled with the Engeland Hansen law. And the, the sediment moves in the direction of the mean flow, but then the, the direction of sediment transport is adjusted to account for secondary circulation and the sort of gravitational deflection of sediment on lateral side slopes. So that's the sand component. There's also a finer silt component that's handled using an advection diffusion equation. And all of these sorts of process representations are fairly standard. I mean, the models I referred to, they vary in their complexity and their sophistication, but they're all using these sorts of approaches. Within this model, there are a couple of other um, aspects of the process representation, which are in fact extremely simple. So all of the grid cells are defined as either active channel bed or floodplain. And there are very simple rules for how those cells can change from one class to another. So floodplain cells, which are vegetated, can be converted into active channel cells by bank erosion. And the rates of bank erosion are just modelled as a function of the sediment transport rate in the near bank cell. The sediment's removed from the floodplain cell Okay, but the floodplain cell is not actually lowered until sufficient sediment has been removed from it to bring it down to the level of the channel bed in the cell adjacent to the bank. And that keeps a fairly vertical um, or fairly steep bank as the bank retreats. There's a very simple vegetation component which basically just converts active channel cells into floodplain cells when cells have not been inundated by a small um, specified sort of threshold depth over a certain time period. Now those parameterizations are extremely simple, but they're enough to give you some stabilizing effects for vegetation and to give you migrating um, bank lines, which are necessary to produce some of the sort of dynamics that I'm gonna show you. So I'm just gonna start by showing you three simulations, and all driven initially from a straight channel. The flow is from left to right, uh, flatbed, although there are some small random elevations, uh, elevation perturbations there. A series of hydrographs run through here, um, although actually the movies are only made up of the low flow images because it gets quite hard to follow when the water level is going up and down. And really all I'm trying to do here is illustrate that there's a range of channel behaviour um, that's produced by differences in certain controlling factors. So for these simulations there's differences in the rate at which the vegetation is established, differences in the strength of the banks, and differences in grain size, slope and bed roughness which control the mobility of the sand. So I'm just going to run these things. They all start off in a fairly similar way with sort of uh, unit bars migrating through the channel but they quickly then take on different forms. So up at the top we've got a simulation with, with strong banks and slowly um, growing or, or vegetation which establishes slowly on bars and the result of that is that the channel doesn't widen, there's no space for the bars to establish or for the water level to drop at least which is necessary for the vegetation to become established and so you maintain this sort of dynamic braided form. Whereas in the bottom simulation, uh, that's, that's got more rapid channel widening and also um, rapid vegetation growth and that creates space for bars and floodplains to form. And we end up with that sort of uh, multi-threaded meandering system and also you might have noticed in that um, many branches forming so there's a tendency for channels uh, for bifurcations to occur and for the, some of the bifurcates to ultimately be abandoned. And the middle simulation um, kind of contains aspects of both of those sorts of behaviour. Okay, now what's driving that? It's partly those simple parameterizations of bank strength and vegetation growth, but there's also an important effect of sediment mobility in this model. Um, so what we're seeing is that where sediment, where the sand is more mobile, the gravitational deflection of the sediment down lateral side slopes is weaker. Okay, and that reduces the amount that sand that's being transported away from bar tops so the bars grow more rapidly and that tends to drive the production of these um, bifurcations in the channel. Okay, now I'll come back to that, that, that sand mobility mechanism in a moment. Okay, just one other simulation from this I want to show uh, which is uh, not a movie but just six snapshots 
from a simulation uh, where the, the only real difference here between this and those other simulations is that the vegetation grows very rapidly in this simulation. So it starts off actually with a straight single thread channel, which quickly then gives, develops this sort of sinuous tau wig, which translates downstream. Uh, the, the individual bends then start to amplify. You can see there's some sort of quite nice scroll bar topography on the insides of the bends. And because of that scroll bar topography, during the high flows, the water um, is focused across those shoots on the scrolls. Uh, and that then leads to cutoff. And you can see there's a couple of cutoffs in there. And also, we see some sort of reactivation of, of channels on the, uh, on the floodplain. OK, so uh, I guess what's the take home message here? I think we've got to the point, and maybe not just in this model, but with other two, di two dimensional morphodynamic models of this type, where we're beginning to be able to simulate the full range of channel patterns. Or maybe, that's, maybe I go too far to say the full range, but certainly a nice wide range of channel patterns that we see in nature. Okay, so, so that's obviously a positive, but there is considerable uncertainty still in the process parameterizations here, and I try to pick out what I think are the, the key issues that need to be addressed. Um, and many of them relate to that idea about sand mobility and how that could be in important in controlling bar growth and bi bifurcation dynamics. So I've picked out a whole series of things that are important in driving those processes. So whether the sand is moving as bed load or in suspension, um, how the direction of sand transport deviates from the mean flow direction, which is controlled by how secondary flow and that sort of uh, gravitational deflection mechanism, how they've been parameterized. Another mechanism, um, which is actually not included in this model, but it's included in other models, is the, uh, the adaption length of sediment. So over, um, over what distance does it take for the sediment transport rate to come into equilibrium with the transport capacity of the flow? That's potentially an important effect. And then there are also all sorts of effects that relate to bed form, so spatial and temporal variations in roughness. Uh, and the fact that the bed forms are actually what's controlling the topography, the local topography, and therefore they should be influencing the steering of sediment. And none of those bed form effects are incorporated in the model at the moment because the, the, these sorts of two-dimensional models only represent the mean bed topography, not the local bed forms. So there are all sorts of uncertainty in the process parameterization. And what that means is that although these sorts of models can represent a wide range of channel patterns, if you wanted to use one of them to simulate a specific channel, and you knew the hydrologic regime and the sediment supply regime and the slope and those sorts of things, and you were to use the model to simulate those things, you would probably find it didn't simulate the right channel pattern. And you would need to tune the calibration to produce the right channel pattern. OK, now that's, that's a significant issue, but potentially more significant if you want to then use these sorts of models to investigate how rivers might respond to environmental change. You want to know that the, um, the sensitivity of the model to any sort of environmental forcing is similar to the sensitivity of real rivers. And we don't net yet know that because of the uncertainty in this sort of process representation. So that's an issue that needs to be addressed partly through... Uh, model development aided by uh, more high resolution field data sets and also possibly by carrying out um, numerical experiments with high fidelity models, with 3D CFD models, the sorts of which we saw some of yesterday, uh, and that could help improve these parameterizations. One other effect I think that's worth mentioning here, there's a problem with boundary condition uncertainty as well. So at the upstream inlet of these sorts of models, you need to introduce some sort of perturbation. So if we look in anywhere, say, in, our, in a braided channel, halfway down the reach, we will see there are bars moving around, there are channels are move, moving around. There's a certain amount of noise in the system that's just a product of the internal dynamics. And you need to introduce that noise at the inlet to mimic that effect. If you don't, or if you introduce a very weak inlet perturbation, as you can see in that sort of second uh, braided river simulation there, then what happens is the channel stabilizes and then we have a low braid intensity with large stable islands. Whereas with a strong inlet perturbation, we get a much more dynamic channel with, with smaller braid bars. And there's a similar problem with meandering channels. As you can see the example there at the bottom. OK, so on the, on the right-hand side of that meandering simulation, we've got lovely high sinuosity meander bends. But on the left-hand side near the inlet, we've got a really messy floodplain with all sorts of abandoned channels. And what's happening there is that the, the period, periodicity of the inlet perturbation is out of phase with the, the translation rate of the meander bends. And that's driving uh, cutoffs and channel abandonment near the inlet. And you see exactly the same ha thing happening in experimental attempts to simulate meandering channels. OK, now what I want to do now is move on and think about things at a larger spacious scale. So move outside the channel belt, or think about the interaction between the channel belt and the, and the larger floodplain. So I just going back to that issue that I mentioned previously of these models that are intended to do that and to look at things like long-term floodplain evolution and alluvial architecture, and the fact that they're typically not driven by flow hydrodynamics. 
So an example that's relevant to what I'm going to be talking about, the model of, um, model of Alan, How Alan Howard that uses the Johansson and Parker meander migration model, and then a very simple parameterization of overbank sedimentation. Not exactly this exponential function, basic, but basically an exponential function. So you've got declining um, deposition rates with distance from the channel. And of course, the key question there is, is what's the decay rate? Okay, and it should be a function of grain size, but it should also be a function of something like the advection velocity of the water across the floodplain. And it's highly uncertain what value you should use for that parameter. So, is it possible to come up with a slightly more physically based approach of doing that sort of thing? So, what we've done is we've taken a, a one dimensional model for the channel and a two dimensional model for the floodplain and coupled them together. Um, both the 1D and the 2D scheme are solving the shallow water equations and an advection diffusion equation for sediment transport. What we want to do ultimately is run this model over very long time periods, so thousands of years. So that's pretty computation intensive, so we need to, um, we need to make the model more efficient. And one way of doing that is it, implementing it on a grid with a variable resolution, so we use a quad tree grid. And the other way is to simplify the numerics a little bit. So whereas the other model was, uh, was, was second order accurate, this is only first order accurate. So that, these things speed it up a little bit. Now we're applying the model um, on the Rio Beni, which I showed you earlier, to try and model patterns of sedimentation and think about total sediment flux uh, from the channel to the floodplain. I'm just going to show you a very simple example so that you can get an idea of the sorts of spatial scales that we're working at. So this is a 100 kilometer uh, section. I'm just going to run a simple six month hydrograph through here. Only a few time steps and you'll be able to see the sort of uh, pretty coarse detail that we're working at. So you see that those patterns are suspended sediment concentration. So you see the, the water moves out onto the floodplain via very localized breaches. The sediment moves out onto the floodplain and the sediment concentration declines. Basically the flood wave has gone through there and the sediment concentration has declined because either the sediment has been deposited or it's drained back into the channel. And then we've got water left on the floodplain. Now, if we run that model over many floods, we can start to, to sum up and get an idea of average, um, average or mean annual rates of overbank sedimentation. So there are a couple of examples there. And there are all sorts of factors uh, contributing to uncertainty in these sorts of things that I wanted to highlight. And the first one in these sorts of environments is the dem. So we're working on a large tropical river where the only information we've got to, to define the dem is SRTM which is pretty problematic because the, obviously the, we, we need to then remove the vegetation from the SRTM, which is not straightforward. And we can use um, various um, Landsat vegetation classifications and information, either remote sensing information or, or field surveys that we've got of vegetation heights to try and remove that vegetation. But there's many different ways that we could do it, producing many different DEMs, leading to many different patterns of overbank sedimentation. So that's a potentially a significant source of uncertainty, at least in the spatial patterns of sedimentation, if not in the total flux of sediment to the floodplain, possibly. Now, one of the ways that we're trying to um, constrain some of the uncertainty is to compare the model results with some measurements of overbank sedimentation. So we have a set of, um, considering the size of the floodplain, you know, hundreds of kilometers in either direction, uh, we're, given that we're using sort of 1.5 centimeter diameter sediment cores, there's obviously a, there's some slight issues there. We've got, we've got sort of several hundred cores. We're using about 100 for this comparison here. And because there's so much spatial variability in these processes in the field, what we've done is average um, sedimentation so that we can look at a sort of or average core um, estimates of sedimentation so we can see the uh, sort of trend in the average sedimentation um, as you move across the floodplain. That's what those blue boxes are on there and the numbers represent the number of cores that are involved in the averages. And then we've got a sort of envelope on there which is giving you a very crude idea of some of the uncertainty when we run multiple model runs with different DEMs, different parameterizations of roughness, uh, different parameterizations of sedimentation. Uh, we get a sort of envelope or envelope of possible uh, sedimentation results. Uh, now this is in, by no means a, a, a rigorous uncertainty analysis, we need to do that yet, but it just gives you some idea that there is considerable uncertainty here. Kind of interestingly, um, you can see the red line on there and the yellow line, they represent model runs uh, with different parameterizations of overbank sedimentation. And what we find is that when you change the parameterization of overbank sedimentation, not surprisingly, it has a significant effect on the, um, the gradient of deposition across the floodplain. And the implication of that is it would have a significant effect on the development of a topographic ridge over time. It doesn't have a significant effect really on the total amount of sediment that's being deposited on the floodplain. Really what seems to be controlling that is, is uncertainty in the boundary conditions, you know, the, the flood hydrographs, the sediment load, and also the representation of sediment exchanges between the main channel and the floodplain. 
Okay, the last thing I really want to mention is we, we then try to take this sort of model and think about how we can go back to these models of, of long-term floodplain evolution and, and ideas about topographic ridge construction which might ultimately lead to avulsion. So what we've done is taken our um, hydrodynamically driven sedimentation model that I was just showing you the results for and we've then coupled that to a very simple meander migration model. And we start these simulations with a flat floodplain and a straight channel and we allow our channel to meander and for um, sediment to be deposited on the floodplain through a series of floods. Because we're interested in the formation of, um, of an alluvial ridge, we also need to enforce some um, aggradation of the channel. So we're specifying a main channel aggradation rate that's just being applied um, to the 1D component of the model, not on the floodplain. And you see we've run this at the moment for several hundred floods and over time our alluvial ridge develops. So what we then want to do is think about whether we can look at the results of this model and interpret them in the context of the sorts of simple models of floodplain evolution and alluvial architecture that have been used that don't include any sort of hydrodynamic component and think about whether this model tells us something about the assumptions of those models that maybe aren't right or need to be improved or the, or the parameterizations in these models. And there are three things I think that are worth mentioning at this stage, this is pretty early stage of this work, but worth mentioning at this stage in the context of that. So I said, as I said, these models that typically don't include a hydrodynamic component, they represent overbank sedimentation by assuming it fits some sort of exponential decay law. And the, the big question is, what's the decay coefficient? Is it a constant? Does it change through time? What really controls it? When we run this model, what we see, and I've just picked out results from one of the simulations here, is that broadly speaking, if you average the, the spatially distributed sedimentation patterns, they do follow an um, exponential law. However, the decay coefficient changes through time. So what is happening here is as the alluvial ridge develops, uh, the conveyance of sediment away from the channel to the floodplain becomes more efficient and the decay coefficient goes down. And that would introduce a sort of negative feedback, whereas the alluvial ridge, when the alluvial ridge grew, it would begin to grow more slowly. So that's an, potentially an important effect which is not incorporated in these sorts of models at the moment, but could be parameterized using these sorts of results possibly. Okay, there's a, a second interesting effect. If we look at the, we take our alluvial ridges from a whole series of simulations, and each one of the points on that graph represents a different simulation. If we take our alluvial ridges, we can calculate all sorts of topographic indices from, from them, because those are the sorts of indices that are often used to predict avulsions, things like the, the super elevation of the, uh, of the, <laughs> I don't need to answer that, I take it. Um, so the super elevation of the, of the channel belt above the floodplain, or the gradient, the transverse gradient of the channel belt. Uh, so what we've got here is a plot of the transverse gradient after 600 floods for a series of alluvial ridges, 20 different simulations, and how the, how the, uh, the ridge gradient varies as a function of certain parameters. Now what we see um, is that as you increase the suspended sediment load of the system, we're moving from the green line up to the yellow line, and you see an increase in the alluvial ridge gradient, which is what you would expect. More, more suspended sediment, more deposition, a larger alluvial ridge. As you increase the migration rate of the channel, and that's moving from the red solid line to the red dashed line, um, what you see is that the, the alluvial ridge is being reworked by channel migration, and that's reducing the gradient, the transverse gradient of the alluvial ridge. The effect that's more interesting here is what happens when you change the rate of channel bed aggradation, and there seem to be two things going on. So for the highest um, channel bed aggradation rates, what we're seeing is that as the channel aggrades more rapidly, um, the alluvial ridge becomes steeper, or its transverse gradient becomes steeper, which is what you would expect. But we're also seeing that at low, um, low relative um, channel bed aggradation rates, uh, as that aggradation rate increases, actually the alluvial ridge gradient is going down. So there are, there, are, there are two effects here. Um, one of them is that as the, um, as the channel bed aggrades, it effectively encourages aggradation of the channel belt. But also as the channel, belt, as the channel bed aggrades, it reduces the bankful discharge capacity of the channel, which changes uh, the way water and sediment are conveyed to the back of the floodplain. Um, in some situations, particularly with low suspended sediment loads for the channel, that effect actually dominates and we, we're seeing a reduction in the transverse ridge gradient. Okay, now this is just one set of simulation but it seems to imply there's some much more complex behavior going on than we see currently in those sorts of simple um, parameterizations of long-term channel evolution, alluvial ridge construction, etc. 
The last thing I want to mention in the context of those particular um, simulations, this is a pattern of um, sediment deposition on the floodplain. So you can see a pink line there and a blue line, which represent the channel positions at two different points in time over the simulation, so 230 and 280 flood events. The black area in between is what's been reworked between those periods, so I'm not looking at the sedimentation rates there. The rest of the area is showing a sedimentation across the floodplain, average per event. And what we see is that sediment is concentrated as splays, and the splays are located predominantly around the apex of meander bends. Okay, and we can look at several different simulations and over the course of simulations and we see similar behaviour. The sedimentation is dominated by these splays on the outside of meander bends. And there's a consistency there um, when we look at uh, the results from our, our coring on the Rio Beni. Okay, so you don't, you don't have to look at all the bars there. If you just look at the, the blue bar showing meander migration rate and the red bar showing deposition rate, what we tend to see is that deposition rates are highest on the, at the apex of meander bends that are migrating rapidly. And what's we assume is happening here is that rapid migration of the meander bend is leading to destruction of the levee and creation of breach points, which is where the flow is focused and where the splays are generated. So there seems to be some sort of consistency here between model and field situation, and possibly we could use these sorts of models to investigate the relationships between the sediment load of the channel, the, uh, the migration rate uh, of the channel, and um, the frequency and the depth of these breach points which represent potential sites for evolution. So we might be able to build simple parameterizations which could then go into our long-term models of channel evolution, or floodplain evolution, sorry. Okay, last thing I want to mention in that context, we're now trying to apply the model on the Mekong. Um, and I've just got a Landsat image showing you here about 50 kilometers of channel. And you can see in the red boxes, if I zoom in on those, we've got a whole series of these lovely splays uh, which seem to be the key to um, supplying water from the main channel to the floodplain. So what we're now trying to do is, is change our scheme. So instead of having a 1D network to represent the channel, actually what we need is a 1D network to represent the channels on these splays. And that's a much more complex proposition. So just to summarize, um, I've tried to look at things at two different spatial scales. You know, the, I think 2D morphodynamic modeling has moved on to the point where we can simulate what look like really realistic channels, but there's still huge uncertainty of the parameterizations that we need to address. Computational power has moved on to the point that we're now actually able to get hydrodynamics into some of our models of really long-term floodplain construction. And, you know, and we can either do that to develop improved models, albeit models that take a long time to run, or we can use those models to try and build improved parameterizations that can still then be implemented in simple alluvial architecture models. One thing I really haven't talked about is channel belt avulsion, um, which, to be honest, is a complete nightmare. And um, it's something that we could all, do, you know, there's, avulsion is a, is a problem. It's not just in rivers, in, flood, in floodplains, in fans, in fan deltas, in alluvial fans, even gullying on hill slopes. It's a community problem that I don't think we've really managed to tackle yet. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Excellent talk. I'm more interested in subsurface and in what, is, what you're doing is preserved in the subsurface. And have you looked or thought about inverse modeling and looking at, say, geophysical data, where I can show you geophysical data on my computer that shows these patterns in the subsurface? Is there a way maybe to use your parameterization, do some inverse modeling, and figure out what combination of parameters are explaining some maybe geophysical data? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to do something like that. We've, we've taken some results from some of the sort of 2D high resolution models and tried to make comparisons between them and GPR data that have been collected on the, uh, the Rio Paraná and we're also collecting on other large rivers. And, and so it's definitely a direction we're trying to move in, but it's really problematic because, you know, as you know, you've got, I mean, you could, and hopefully maybe you can give me some ideas about how to deal with these problems, but we, you know, we've got GPR data which is telling us one thing We've got a model which is telling us something else. There are completely different spatial scales. Um, actually trying to decide what you can compare with what and, and what useful information you can extract from it is a challenge, but you know, something you might be able to help me with. <laughs> 